Okay, so hello and welcome. And today is Earth Day and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you, Bernie Krauss, uh, somebody who has been listening to the Earth now uh, and listening to the sounds of the natural world uh, since about 1968, I believe, um, when yes. you founded the Wild Sanctuary. And um, coincidentally, uh, this year is the 50th year since the um, release of the In the Wild Sanctuary album uh, mm -hmm. that you released with Beaver. And uh, it's also the 50th year of Earth Day. Uh, so it's a nice uh, moment to, to celebrate, but also to look to the future and to, uh, and um, uh, it's, I mean, you are somebody who has been, um, as we said, listening to the sounds of nature, but also amassing this amazing soundscape archive and really teaching us to, to listen in new ways uh, to the natural world um, with, I believe, over 5,000 hours of uh, yeah. recordings uh, in your collection and um, the Christ Natural Soundscape Collection. Um, recording about 15,000 individual species of... Uh... Well, I've, those are the species that I have identified. Oh. I mean, there are probably millions of species in there if you count the insects and frogs. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a large archive. It's a large archive and a, and a large orchestra. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, so why are we talking today? Um, we are... Um, talking in, in, a, in a moment which is a, a very strange moment, a challenging moment for the world, a moment when we're, yeah. uh, we're under lockdown uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which is putting a lot of people in very challenging situations. Um, but it is also uh, creating uh, an effect um, on our experience of the natural world. And, and this is one of the things that I would love to talk to you about today um, and this, uh, this effect uh, that people are talking about that there is silence in the cities due to less human activity and that many people uh, uh, are suddenly tuning in in new ways to the, the sounds of, of uh, the natural world around us and, and I think it, for that reason it's, it's a really interesting moment to discuss sound and this acoustic world that we're living in. Um, but uh, I, I I would also like to to um, uh, to to explore uh, a little bit of your your work and and uh, how you turn to recording soundscapes and then at the end uh, we want to announce uh, quite an exciting and new initiative um, that uh, we are embarking on right now. So, Great. but um, maybe first though uh, I can start by. Uh, um, uh, really asking how you suddenly became fascinated with the sounds of the natural world. If you turn your mind back to that, uh, that moment in 1968, uh, you'd been uh, a pioneer with the Moog synthesizer and recording with uh, um, all sorts of interesting uh, people, ranging from the Doors to George Harrison and working with, with the Weavers and Pete Seeger. Uh, how did you suddenly become fascinated with the sounds of nature? Well, it's very interesting. I grew up in a family that really wasn't terribly fond of animals. And uh, we never spent much time outside. We never camped. Uh, we rarely went out for a picnic or anything like that. And certainly when, when I would bring a stray animal home, uh, my parents quickly uh, decided that it wasn't going to stay for very long. Um, and uh, so I grew up really kind of terrified of the creature world beyond human. And, um, uh, and it, I carried that into my young adulthood, of course. And when Paul and I, uh, Paul Beaver and I got together in the mid 60s and um, bought one of the first Moog synthesizers off the line and introduced it to pop music and film, um, uh, we were we had to think of new ways to uh, present this material. And one of, the, one of the things that we came up with was maybe to do an album on the theme of ecology. Because Paul and I were at extreme opposites in terms of, uh, in, in terms of politics and everything else practically, but we were good friends. And uh, it was those times when you could still be good friends with, with political opposites. 
in any event, uh, Paul and I decided the one thing that we could do without any uh, thought at the time was um, uh, was to do something on ecology because it was a new field and it was just becoming obvious uh, what uh, to many of us uh, what was happening in the natural world and how under stress and it was and so uh, uh, Paul also refused to go outside and to get involved in um, in recording and so he um, I, I, that whole project was left to me. And um, just at that time, there was new equipment being introduced into the field, uh, new stereo portable recorders that were small and light and easy to use, easy to, to uh, operate. And uh, Paul and I had a couple of uh, beta test machines, which means early design uh, um, um, examples of uh, various machines. And we took, I took a pair of, uh, um, Neumann microphones and the uh, Ewer recorder um, out into the field with me and uh, turned it on for the first time in the in the small woods just north of San Francisco. And when I heard the space open up in that that stereo space open up in my headsets, um, it, it it had an overwhelming effect on me. I've always suffered from a terrible case of attention deficit disorder uh, since the time I was a small kid, and I still, as an adult, um, suffer from it. And the and when I turned on that recorder, like everything, all the anxiety, all the pressure, all the noise uh, in my life. There's lots of different kinds of noise. Uh, it just went away. It just evaporated, and I sat there in in a with a sense of wonder as to what you know it was that made this stuff have that effect on me, and it was the natural soundscape. It was the it was the pair of ravens that were flying overhead, making this <laughs> with each wing beat. Um, it was the stream, the water in the stream trickling in the background. Um, it was the sound of, uh, the, this park was only a few miles from the ocean, and uh, it was the sound of the, uh, of the onshore breeze uh, in the upper canopy of the redwood trees that, that populated that forest. It was a combination of all of these things at once, this kind of gentle fabric of, of wonder, acoustic wonder, that captured my attention, and it captured my attention in a way that I thought right then and there that I wanted to do that, to record that kind of sound for the rest of my life, and I had to figure out a way to do it. That was how strong yeah. the impression was for me. And at that you point, Bernie, were, were you uh, primarily responding aesthetically to the experience, or were you already interested in how you could experience biodiversity through the ears and through sound? Oh, that didn't occur till very much later. Huh. Um, I, I mean, I, w the first impression I had was that it made me feel better physically and psychologically. Mm. That was the first impression. And I wanted to do more of that because I was a very anxious kid. Yes. And so for the next following 10 years, I spent every moment, every spare moment that I had Mm. Uh, away from the studio, out in the field, recording these natural soundscapes and collecting them because when I felt anxious, I would just play them back and listen to them. Yes. Uh, when I couldn't go into the field. And then in 1979, after working on Apocalypse Now, uh, doing the helicopter sounds and a lot of the score, um, uh, I, I was fired eight times during the process of doing Apocalypse Now. <laughs> Um, and and uh, uh, I, I got tired of that. And I thought to myself, I really want to do something different in my life and something that's more engaging and more, um, in, in a way that made me feel better. Yes. Uh, so so um, what happened was um, I went back to school uh, in 1979 and I um, got my PhD in bioacoustics. And I've never looked back. Mm. Uh, it, originally, it was marine bioacoustics. Yeah. 
uh, because I liked working on the water and working with whales and, and dolphins and fish. And, and Right, so you started off with marine bioacoustics. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's a, another thing that uh, just um, yesterday, I believe, there was a report that um, people are also investigating the effect of COVID-19 uh, underwater. I mean, looking at the effect of the on the underwater uh, sound environment, uh, which yeah. uh, apparently is quite significant. Uh, but um, but I, but um, maybe um, to come back to this theme of how one can experience and understand biodiversity uh, through the your soundscape recordings, um, maybe I'd just uh, play a little clip which I found absolutely fascinating. Uh, which was uh, a recording, um, I believe you made in the Osa Peninsula in Costa Rica. Yes. Uh, and um, maybe let's just play it and listen to it first, and then maybe you can explain a little bit what's going on. So it's effectively sure. two clips, a kind of before and after clip. But I, I'll I'll play the before and after first, and then, uh, then sure. we, you can you can tell us what what we have been listening to. So maybe I'll, I'll just try and share the screen. So. Now you should be able to see it. So let's just listen. That's the before. And the after. So can you can you tell us, Bernie, you know, what what have we just listened to? So what 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 was the, this before and after experience that you had in Costa Rica? Well, these are two examples from the same habitat. Uh, one example uh, recorded in 1989 mm. at, in the Osa Peninsula, uh, which is kind of in the southwestern part of Costa Rica, uh, down close to the Panama border. And um, uh, it, it was a very uh, vital habitat. Uh, it hadn't been logged at all. It hadn't been encroached on. There were no roads, not many roads cut through it. And uh, so I went there to record there in 1989 and captured this kind of pristine rainforest habitat that was still existing then. And then I came back in 1996, um, seven years later, to record the same habitat, but it, it wasn't there. It was completely clear cut. Mm. And uh, this was a time when the president of uh, Costa Rica um, had said that there was, you know, he was going to dedicate his most of his uh, uh, tenure as, as president um, to preserve forest habitats. Well, here was one example that, that was gone and I wanted to capture it. So you see really how the soundscape infers um, uh, the condition of the habitat by yeah. listening to it before and after in very short segments. I mean, this is, these are 15 second segments. It's extraordinary. I, I mean, that um, amazingly sharp difference between this incredibly rich, you know, howler monkeys and other species, and then suddenly it's uh, almost silence. Sure, sure, yeah. it's, uh, it's very compelling. They're very compelling stories, and we've got a lot of them. Yeah, and um, I mean, this was one of the things that led to this uh, incredible project you did to the, of the Great Animal Orchestra in uh, cooperation with the Fondation Cartier in Paris, yes. um, which uh, is uh, at, at once an artwork, but also something that seems to provide insights into uh, really important areas of science and uh, biodiversity and environmental studies. So maybe. Can you say a little bit about your great animal orchestra and what the vision was behind that? Sure. The, the great animal orchestra uh, was initiated really by a book that I wrote of the same name, mm. same name. It was a great animal orchestra. Um, the, uh, well, anyway, it was published by Achette uh, mm. in English and, in, and uh, translated into seven or eight languages, I guess, including German and French. Yes. Um, the idea behind it was how, uh, how the animals informed our culture, human culture. Mm. Um, they taught us to dance because we watched and mimicked the movements of the animals as they, as they, you know, uh, navigated the spaces within their forests and plains of Africa. 
we learned melody from animals because uh, that's what they provide us. That's the inf kind yes. of information they provide us. And also, um, the uh, one of the things that they, they do is they show us how sound is articulated, uh, particularly in healthy habitats where we have all of the different creatures forming niches, acoustic niches within which they vocalize. Um, so it was really important. So that book really kind of explained how all of these acoustic uh, features of the animal world informed everything that we do, our music, our language, and so on. Uh, so that was the that was the theme of the book. Now, when we got Cartier wanted to take that data and that information that I had and transform it into a work of art. Mm -hmm. And so that was the, we have a way now of illustrating sound uh, through what's called spectrograms. So we have a visual yes. we have a visual image of sound in real time, and so you can watch these spectrograms go by as the as as sound moves through time and you can see the relationships between the animal voices in these spectrograms well um uh, originally i wanted to do something that was very small scale um but we didn't have the we didn't have the um uh, way of doing that uh, that would that would engage large audiences, particularly the audiences that Cartier wanted to uh, work with. Mm -hmm. So th they created a huge space within the uh, Fondation Cartier in Paris, uh, the museum that they have, and it was a th literally a theatrical space. Yes, and we transformed the data that I have into works of art and my idea of art has always been to create performances of wonder that I most want others to hear and see manifest in the world. Yes. So Cartier had a way of, of, of doing that. They showed me how mm. and uh, together, you, you know, we put together this piece also with uh, United Visual Artists in, um, in London uh, who uh, created the algorithm for the large uh, projections of spectrograms, of streaming mm. spectrograms across the space. And it was a huge space. It was like, it was like, um, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing it was like 20 meters by 15 meters in size, yeah. you know, the room, and um, maybe like four meters tall, this, the ceiling. Um, so it was like it was a big space and uh, people would just sit on the floor and listen to it and they watched this and listened to this material uh, mesmerized for an hour and a half this program was an hour and a half long and they would sit there and just listen and kids would be silent they wouldn't be slapping each other or bumping each other or yelling at each other or watching their cell phones they actually uh got inspired to pay attention to what was going on around them. Yes, and that was how I first experienced your work, actually, Bernie, when, uh, <coughs> excuse me, you know, in the Fondation Cartier in Paris. And uh, it, I was amazed by exactly, as you say, this uh, people were wrapped, they were absorbed, they were staying yeah. for long periods of time and just uh, experiencing the sound and then the very subtle uh, uh, visualizations with the sonograms and, and uh, uh, allowing just the, just the this um, identification of when a, a new species would uh, start to vocalize, uh, but it was uh, just remarkable how how captivated people were. And it's amazing. Um, it's amazing to see and to hear and to watch mm -hmm. how th these kinds of um, performance pieces engage kids who are young, five, six, seven years old. Uh, to to us older adults, yeah. um, it crosses all language barriers because these natural soundscapes are, like I say, they're the origin of language. So mm. they're kind of embedded in our DNA. Yeah, and, yeah. and we respond to them because they're narratives of place. They're narratives of time. I and mean, you, uh, you spoke. You, you briefly touched on this this idea around the acoustic niches, which has been a very important aspect of your work and this idea yeah. that 
you know, different species uh, occupy different niches to so that they're yeah. not competing uh, for bandwidth, so to speak. Um, and um, uh, but I, I'm wondering um, now, do you think there's some a different situation because of the lack of traffic in cities and so on, because of the lockdown? Or is are, are the sounds of nature qualitatively different now um, that people can experience in, in cities because of what's happening? Well, I think so, because many people are res responding. First of all, <laughs> there may, I, I think because we don't really fully understand sound uh, in the ways that we need to, uh, to, make a, a, to make sound really valuable to us as a culture, people keep talking about the silence in the cities. Yes. Well, silence means no sound, right. it, it, the yeah. absence of sound. And that's not what's happening. Yeah. There is sound in cities, and and wildlife has begun to reoccupy their former territory. Uh, and the birds that are singing aren't singing necessarily louder. It's yeah. just that there isn't the background noise to impede the sound for us, and we and and we hear it for the first time. I just got just before we went on the air here. Um, I just got an email from my publisher in New York for yes. my new book. I'm writing a new book on uh, just on sound on this very subject. Yeah. And he said to me, you know, and he's he's the publisher and the editor of a large publishing house in, in, in New York. And he said to me, I've been sitting out on my balcony. Mm. And he said, and for the first time, I've actually heard birdsong. There's no traffic on the street. And there yes. aren't people screaming and yelling and dogs barking. He said, yes. people are inside. He said, and I'm sitting out on my balcony and listening to birds. I thought I was in a forest this morning. Amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, no, it, it's, I mean, it's, it's become a bit of a, a meme, this idea of, uh, you know, the goats invading uh, the town in Wales. I don't know if you saw them, these wonderful yeah, I did see that. goats, beautiful, very hairy yeah. goats. And then there were... Uh, I guess the the fake story about the dolphins in Venice, uh, which turned out not to be quite true, but there there have been a, a combination of true and uh, false and wildly exaggerated stories about kind of nature occupying cities. But it but it seems at the acoustic level there is uh, probably some validity to this uh, this oh, idea. I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. But I mean, but there's also some mythology around it too, and some things that aren't really clearly understood. For instance, somebody was saying that the birds don't have to sing as loud because they don't have to compete with the background noise. Yes. I don't think, I, I, and, and they don't have to waste as much energy. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure that's right, but it, it's, it, but people are beginning, it doesn't matter. People yeah. are beginning to listen. Yes. And they're listening, they're listening in ways that are more engaged uh, and where they're responding to these natural sounds. And this guy, this guy who was writing me this morning said, it's actually, it actually makes me feel good to hear those. Yes. And it is, it's an antidote. Mm -hmm. These things, these, these soundscapes are really beneficial to us. Yeah. And we've I, got to pay some attention to that because that's really important how we go forward. Yeah, no, I, I think for some people it, it, it has, uh, a strong element of, of hope and optimism to connect in with these uh, sounds, yeah. even even if the story about um, biodiversity and the the loss of biodiversity and including bird biodiversity is not not really a pretty story for the last uh, number of no. years. Um, uh, but but I think you know hopefully that after the pandemic uh, there will remain something of this this uh, sense of connection that some people are finding now in the natural world. I'm, I certainly I'm, hope so. You, you've heard, you've heard the story about uh, in the Guardian. I don't know if you read it. It was several months ago. Like yeah. it, they were talking about three billion birds have disappeared in North America since 1970. I, I heard that approximately 30 percent of the birds are effectively gone from North America. Yeah, it's a shocking statistic. Yeah. Well, it's showing in our recordings. Yeah. yeah. I, mean, I mean, the density and diversity of bird sound is really beginning to diminish. Yeah. And uh, it's a curve I don't want to see. Yeah. I, I was wondering actually on that point. So uh, you came from art, from music, and then you, you went into bioacoustics and then went into this whole world of, of natural soundscapes. But um, uh, presumably all of these recordings that you have amassed uh, are, are a source of great value to scientists to, uh, you know, around the world who are looking at 
changes in biodiversity. Um, how much influence uh, do, do you think your work has on the scientific community? Well, it's, it's just beginning to have influence yeah. now. The, uh, the whole idea of sound has not been really a priority in yes. terms of, and, and, and evaluating the natural world in terms of sound has not been a priority mm -hmm. until very recently. Yes. And um, uh, I'm glad to say I'm playing a role in that in, in terms of uh, the field of soundscape ecology. But it's been a really hard uh, task to convince people that this is really critical and really important and really something that they have to listen to. Um, but, you know, but the, the, the resistance is beginning to soften a little bit. And for that, I'm, I'm pretty grateful. I, w I wanted to see that before the end of my life and i'm happy the way things are going now i just hope i find a home for my archive i want to find an academic home for that yes and of course you you nearly lost everything right when with the fires the wildfires in california um, yeah which is another climate issue yeah. uh, because we were in the middle of uh, we we're in the sixth year of a huge um, uh, historic drought here in california there was hardly any precipitation and in 2017, in October 2017, um, there there was uh, uh, there were winds that were so powerful they were like 120 kilometers an hour. I mean, it was really forceful. It was like a num It was a, like a Category One hurricane. Yes. And and um, and, and so what happened was um, uh, the embers began to burn the woods around where we lived. We had like four hectare uh, where we lived in Glen Ellen and it was all wooded area. And so, because it was so dry, the embers that were blowing from several kilometers away from the north uh, began to come in our direction and it completely destroyed uh, everything that we had on the property, including my archive and my journals, 50 years of journals all my slides from yes. various places that I went. So, uh, uh, it, but luckily I had, I, I had just made a backup copy of my archive uh, that I stored at the Fondation Cartier. I'd made it in March, six months mm -hmm. before the fires in October. And the reason that I got it offshore was because of the current political administration in the U.S., the anti-science stance that they've, taken um uh and uh, and their anti-climate issue you know uh, uh, narrative and so i wanted to make sure as many of my colleagues have done that it would that that this material this important data had got off had been stored offshore yeah i mean, that was a very lucky escape for the material um but yeah. obviously a tragic and difficult situation for you but it, that was uh, as you say uh, a consequence of climate change is it possible, do you think, to, to hear the sound of climate change? Is that something that uh, in your work allows you to do? You bet. You bet. Wow. Um, well, because just listen to my archive 50 years ago, and, uh, and all you have to do is when you listen to it and you realize how many different uh, habitats are gone now. I had 1,100 different kinds of habitats, marine and terrestrial. Yeah. And well over 50% of that collection is either altogether silent or can no longer be heard in any of its original form. Yes. I mean, it's that drastic. Unbelievable. Yeah. And that's and I, largely to climate change, you believe? Yeah, I do believe it's climate change and it's human endeavor because we've changed, we've transformed these, these habitats into something. I don't know. If you had a chance to read uh, David Attenborough's article in the Guardian yesterday, I didn't. But if you it, haven't yeah. read it, read that. Because yeah. It's about it's about human population. Okay. And it makes a correlation, which is really critical to understand. Right. Not that it hasn't been said before, but it's really you know it's yeah. it's. I'm, we're coming close to the end of our time, unfortunately. But um, uh, so one thing that um, I would like to talk about a little bit uh, before we end is uh, last year you came here to, to Germany yeah. and you came to Munich and to where we're building Biotopia Museum and you also came to Nantesbuch, uh, which is a beautiful 
location in the foothills of the Alps where there's a, a foundation looking at the connections between art and nature, the Stiftung Nantes book. And you came and uh, we had a joint masterclass which you hosted on the topic of soundscape recording involving scientists and artists uh, learning your techniques. And I was uh, fortunate enough to go out one morning with you very early at about 4.30 in the morning to... Uh, and you've uh, never been the same. <laughs> I've never been the same. I got the bug. It, uh, you know, it infected me, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, but it really was an amazing experience to go out there and, uh, uh, you know, in the total darkness initially, and then suddenly hear all the different species, uh, the, the different birds beginning to, to sing yeah. in, at, almost on a clock. Um, and, and that's, um, you know, such an interesting phenomenon, this, uh, this dawn chorus uh, where you, uh, which, you know, it seems to be something that's, you know, uh, prevalent around the world, at least in temperate uh, areas, that one has this, almost this clock as the different species uh, wake up and they, they begin to vocalize, particularly right now in spring. Um, and, you know, what, why does that happen? Why is there a, a dawn chorus, this amazing concert and, and, and chorus uh, that we experience every morning? Boy, that's a good question. Uh, well, the, these birds have to establish their territory, and this is yeah. one way that they can establish their territory acoustically yeah. and make their presence known. Not, this is the springtime of the year. They're, they're mating, they're nesting, uh, you know, um, uh, and this is, this is that time when they're most active. And so you, you hit it just at the right moment because it was almost at the, at the peak of the season. Yeah. I mean, it's an amazing phenomenon. And I, I suppose that experience of uh, working together with you and with that uh, fascinating group of people last year um, uh, uh, has inspired us with, the, with this new project uh, the, to, to actually um, uh, get people around the world to make dawn chorus recordings uh, just using smartphones, um, which... Uh, uh, and um, this is a project that we're actually launching to get today uh, together with um, with the Nantes Book uh, Foundation, Stiftung Nantes Book, and uh, with you, we're enormously grateful to have you as an advisor on this, and also with the the Max Planck uh, Institute and the Max Planck Society, uh, Max Planck Institute for Ornithology and in Zeewiesen. But the whole idea of this, I suppose, is that right now we're in this exceptional moment uh, of the coronavirus pandemic and. Uh, you know, people, even people who are locked down in their homes could make a soundscape recording. Uh, they could go yeah. out with their smartphone, even if they can't go out of the house, one could do it from a balcony or even from a window. Uh, and we want to encourage people um, to, to go and make these recordings and, uh, uh, and to have that experience of, of the dawn chorus and, and also to go out with their families. Um, sure. Yeah, so so just, what would just, be your, your hopes for this initiative, if I may ask? Well, it's, it's, it's an affirmation of life. And that's what you're recording. It is, it, for me, it's the affirmation of life. It's the voice of the divine. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and all of the answers about living organisms and the wonders of life are embodied in that sound, in that soundscape. Yeah. So that's wonderful. So that, that, that's a wonderful uh, note to end on. And uh, um, I, I see we're at our final minute, but I, I just wanted to. Uh, first of all, to thank you enormously, Bernie, for, for taking the time uh, to, to, to join us at Biotopia on Earth Day to, to share this exciting story and, and to share your work, but also to, um, also to launch uh, this new initiative, Dawn Chorus, uh, which is uh, going to be uh, live on dawn-chorus.org uh, following today. Uh, and we are hoping that people will go out there inspired by your work and inspired by uh, the sounds uh, that are on our doorstep uh, every morning and uh, uh, make recordings uh, of the dawn chorus and then and then share them and we will map them and then our hope is that uh, this will become a long term project and then we'll actually get to understand the changes in the in the sounds of nature um, uh, as as uh, we go from this particularly unique situation this year and we we uh, see over the the next few years you know what will be the influences of um, back to normal, if there is a back to normal after this, uh, this yeah. moment, uh, yeah. uh, but also how climate change and other uh, 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 things will affect uh, the, the sound that one hears every morning in the dawn chorus. So that's, uh, 
you know, I, I think it's an exciting beginning and we, we just hope uh, uh, many people will, will share their sounds with us. So I hope so too. Thank you, Michael. You've been great. He's Thank great you so much, Bernie. Take care. Great brother. to chat this morning. Bye. Bye, -bye.